30 minutes is a really uh, aggressive time frame to introduce a group of people that doesn't really have much context for this. So I'm going to maybe go a little fast, maybe hopefully not too fast. Um, but also, there's a, you should think of this talk as a, a starting off point, a jumping off point for your in, interest in Rust if you become interested. Um, and maybe there will be a few things here and there that you could uh, sort of jump off and use or look into. Um, I'm going to be writing a blog post over the next uh, few weeks, I think, that talks about how you specifically integrate Rust into a Ruby or Rails application. And I'm not going to talk about that today, because that's kind of its whole other talk. But I think if you, really, if you leave this talk thinking that you really want to use Rust for something real, um, that's probably going to be the best way for you to do that. So keep an eye out for, uh, on the Skylight blog, we'll be talking about it. Yeah, what's up with that? <laughs> so um, I think the way a lot of people look at programming languages is with this uh, sort of quadrant grid. You can see that when they announced Swift, Apple created this quadrant grid. And among, uh, despite the fact that it's really silly, like I don't think Ruby is faster and more performant than, uh, and more performant than JavaScript, um, and I don't, really, I don't understand any of it really. Um, but I think people do think of the world in terms of these quadrants. And I think if I was going to give a talk about Rust and I wasn't me, probably I would also make one of these quadrant diagrams and try to stick Rust in one of the uh, quadrants. And for me, I am showing this because I think it's kind of a bad way to think about program, programs and programming in general. And the reason for that is that in programming, really the only thing that, is, that stays the same is change. The only constant is change. And what that means is that a lot of people have this fixed picture in their head of this trade-off between performance and productivity. And they imagine that that trade-off is kind of fixed. So if you gain a little more productivity, then surely what that means is that you've traded off some performance. Um, but if you look at reality, you look at reality, and this is, let's say, 2005, you'll see, OK, there's the programming language JavaScript, which didn't have that logo at the time. It was a reasonably productive programming language. It was a dynamic language with lambdas. And um, not very fast. Um, and then if you were going to look at that diagram and, and fast forward 10 years, obviously JavaScript hasn't improved its, uh, it ha hasn't really changed that much in terms of productivity. It hasn't gotten, uh, maybe it's gotten a little bit better, but for the most part, the language that most people write today is the same language that most people wrote 10 years ago. So if you were going to think about things as just a trade-off between productivity and performance, you would expect, well, of course, JavaScript hasn't gotten any hasn't become worse in productivity, so that means it must not have gotten faster. But of course, what actually happened during that time is that JavaScript got a little bit more productive with ES5 and some ES6 features, and a lot faster. And really, in, in reality, every language that, has, that sticks around for any period of time tries to figure out ways to improve productivity without reducing performance over time, which means that every single language is always moving. You would, it looks like you should have to go down and to the right, but really, every language is going up and to the right. And when a language changes enough, or when a new language comes out that is sufficiently different from other languages, it enables a whole new generation of people to do something that they couldn't do before. And I think you, JavaScript is a really good example of this. right? JavaScript was really a slow language to begin with. But when JavaScript got fast, and when it got a little more productive, and when the ergonomics of using it on the server got better, it enabled a whole generation of front-end developers to write back-end code. And I think you could, you could say, oh, well, I don't want my jQuery developer writing back-end code. You can say that all you want. But the reality is that if you're looking at the quadrant, you miss these shifts, these changes in the programming landscape that enables whole generations of people, large groups of people, to do something that they weren't able to do before. And Rust is sort of trying to do a similar thing. right? So Rust is a new language. But Rust is also trying to enable people who might not have been willing to do something before, or might not be able to do something before, to do something now. And just to give you a, a high-level sense of what's going on here, before Rust, there were essentially two kinds of languages. There were languages that were safe. And what, what I mean by safe is that if you write a program in the programming language, and there's no bugs in the compiler or the interpreter, your program cannot have a seg fault. Right? So whenever that happens to you in Ruby, what that means is that there's some C code involved. It's not Ruby giving you the seg fault. It's some C code giving you the seg fault. Um, and that's a guarantee. If you write in Ruby, or you write in Python, or you write in Go, because there's a garbage collector in those programming languages, um, you're guaranteed that if you write code, you will not get a seg fault. And then there's other languages, uh, C, C++, and a few other languages of that ilk, that give you 
direct control over where you can put your memory. And that direct control gives you the ability to get better performance, uh, better memory usage, and all that. But the trade-off of that is that if you make a little mistake, if you slip up a little bit, and everybody knows who's ever tried to work with C or C++, that it's not just a matter of learning these five tricks here. It's a matter of being a guru, basically, in the language. If you make any mistakes, it's unsafe, and you could fail. You could segfault. And what Rust is trying to do, fundamentally, at a high level, is to give you the safety of a language like Ruby without forcing everything to go through a garbage collector or a reference counter. So basically giving you the ability to control where your memory is going directly, exactly. And for people who know, that, that could mean putting things on the stack or a whole variety of other places where you might want to allocate memory, and you have direct control over that. But you don't have to trade off safety. And I think uh, from, from an ergonomics perspective, um, if you are a person that has ever tried to write code that's more efficient by having more control, the biggest source of ergonomic pain, the biggest source of productivity, is, is not just that you lose all these high-level features. It's also that at any point you could crash. So just eliminating the ability to ever crash really is a big shift in the landscape of, of what's possible. So what does this enable? What does it mean? So like I said before, I think the way you should always look at the programming landscape is looking for shifts, for changes in what some language is doing, what's possible. What does it mean to have a language that is both low-level and direct memory control, but also safe? What does that enable for us? And what it enables is a whole new generation of people who are systems programmers. And by that, I mean you, everyone in this room. It enables every, a lot of people who maybe would have been excited or interested in low-level systems programming to do it. And, and Node.js, which claims to be uh, low, low to the metal, that's not what I mean when I say systems programming. I don't mean you know, programming on the metal in Node.js. I mean really, really programming on the metal, really programming at the level of the machine. So before I continue, I want to just throw out some real talk here. And that's to say that all of us in this room, including myself, have been part of the high-level language tribe. We spend a lot of time talking to ourselves and each other about why we find ourselves being productive in high-level languages. And a big part of the high-level language uh, a big part of what we tell each other with the, in high-level language is a lot of Yagni. You aren't going to need it. And some of that stuff has to do with features that you don't need. But if, for this purpose of this talk, what I'm talking about is you aren't going to need better performance. And I think that's a thing that we tell each other a lot. And I think that in many, many cases, maybe perhaps most cases, that ends up being true. But sometimes there are some cases where you actually do need better performance. And I'll give you some examples of this. So, one example is, anytime anybody ever says 60, 60 FPS, or jank, or real time, or high frequency trading, or anything like that, anytime anybody ever talks about needing predictable performance, I think 60 FPS is a good example, they need better control than you get with a garbage collector. Um, anytime anybody ever says, I need to use less memory, me memory's too high. Um, if you're writing a cross-platform uh, cross library, like, a, like LibSAS, something that is meant to be embedded in a lot of different places, that's a place where you care about performance. And, and more importantly, whenever you're starting to dig into your programming language internals, whenever you're reading the Ruby C code or trying to understand the JavaScript JIT, these are cases where it turns out that you do need the performance. And what it means when we say, I don't have to worry about performance, I don't have to worry about the details, I don't have to worry about whether I put this on the stack or the heap, I don't have to worry about whether this is allocating or not. What that means is not just that you don't have to worry about it, which is a great blessing when, you, when it doesn't matter, but it also means that you can't worry about it. And I think, perhaps more importantly, it means that if you figure out a way to control what you're doing by reading the C code or figuring out how the JIT works or doing some hacks, it means it's very, very difficult to communicate to other developers about what it is that you're trying to do from a performance perspective. And sometimes it does matter. So here I have a couple of examples from Ember, which um, in JavaScript there's very, very good JITs. But those very, very good JITs are very opaque. Um, but when, you're, when you end up caring about performance, you end up really trying to understand how it works. So here's an example where we have a function called make dictionary, and we do a whole bunch of pointless things that are total no-ops in the semantics of the language. But what it does is it tells the runtime to not try to uh, you make this into a struct. And that allows, uh, allows us to, get, to avoid certain deoptimizations. And you can see there's a big comment here. Um, Here's another thing. Uh, there's a function called intern, which takes a string and gives back a non-rope version of the string. And that ends up having performance problems. 
uh, to not do it. And you can see on top, it says, when do I need this function? For the most part, never. Premature optimization is bad, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the whole comment, <laughs> right? So it turns out that when you care about performance, we should think about what is the point of a programming language. The point of a programming language is to let us communicate with other human beings about what it is that we're trying to do. And if it turns out that you don't care about performance, then you don't want to waste your time communicating with other human beings about performance. That becomes a waste of time. It becomes very noisy. It becomes difficult for you to understand what's going on in your code. But as Dave Herman, who founded Mozilla Research, says, when you actually do care about performance, then performance is part of the domain of discourse for you and your collaborators. You actually want a way in the programming language to explain the performance requirements that you actually have. So it is true that it often doesn't matter. And I, I think what I'll say clearly here is if it doesn't matter, then using a programming language like Rust to solve that particular problem that you have is not going to be the best use of your time because it's going to end up forcing you to say a lot of things that you don't care about. But there are many cases where it actually does matter, where performance actually has a real impact, where memory usage has a real impact, like Skylight, which is the project I work on that caused me to get into Rust in the first place. And when it matters, it's actually a blessing that you have. It's not that I have to write all these annotations. It's that I'm able to communicate to Carl and Tom and all the other programmers who I'm working with exactly what performance requirements we expect to have from the program that we're writing. So that's why you should care about Rust and the kinds of cases you should care about. Now I want to get into sort of what is Rust. So I can spend a lot of time talking about the low-level performance. I think you can write, do some benchmarks if you want to look at sort of all the performance features. I want to talk a little bit more, because this is a Ruby crowd, about high-level productivity. And before I talk about productivity, I want to talk about one really important principle in Rust, which is the idea of zero-cost abstraction, which I know sounds a little bit like snake oil. Um, but the idea behind zero-cost abstractions is that when you add the ability to do an abstraction in a programming language, in most cases, if you're not very careful, you end up adding a little bit of cost, a little bit of cost, a little bit of cost. And then when you get to something that's abs as abstract as Rails, you end up with a lot of cost. And the idea behind Rust is to find abstractions that you can enable, and I'll show you some examples of that in a minute, um, that you can add with very little or zero cost. And what that means is that you can get pretty abstract in terms of the programs that you're able to write without it introducing a whole lot of cost. And I think this is a big part of what is really appealing to me about Rust, which is that even if we didn't consider the safety aspects of writing in a programming language like C, and of course I do, the fact that C is so difficult to, abs to write abstractions in is, is really also a big problem. So I'm going to start by looking at some, a program in Ruby that you can look at if you go to active support, and that's the blank method that exists on strings in Ruby. So here's how it's implemented. I just dragged this out of active support. So that you reopen the string class, you specify a blank regex, and that's there because performance reasons, you don't want to be putting it in line. And then you investigate the blank regex at runtime. And then similarly, we have this method on array, which is basically an alias for empty. And then we have nil class. Nil class is always considered blank. And then you know there's more and more. There's booleans and whatever. And this exact kind of problem, this exact kind of thing, is actually something that Rust lets you talk about. And I'll, talk, I'll show you how that works in Rust. So in Ruby, actually, the, the, what I showed you here is sort of traditionally how you, you would do it. And that basically globally opens up all these objects and adds the blank method. There's also a new feature in Ruby called refinements, which allows you to do a similar thing but in a scoped way. And that's more like how it works in Rust. So uh, first of all, in Rust, when you, uh, everything's statically typed. So if you want to say that there's a blank method, you say that there's a trait called is blank. And we just make a trait called is blank, and we say that it has a function on it. That function takes whatever you know, self, whatever it is, and it returns a Boolean. And the first thing that we do is we implement is blank for strings. And that ampersand string thing over there just means that it's a static fixed size string. So there's also strings that you could push things onto, basically immutable strings. This is, that symbol there means immutable string, uh, that guy over there. And this regex over here basically is uh, a macro, so anything with bang at the end of it, which is going to change to prefix amp at soon, but anything with uh, bang means it's a macro. And that means basically that it gets converted into something fast. So even though it's a regex, it doesn't end up being interpreted every time. Um, and basically what this is doing is essentially equivalent thing that we did in Ruby. We basically say we have this is blank trait and it has an is blank method, and it returns a Boolean, and here is the implementation of it. Um, you can do similar things for other types. So we've now said, I want to implement is blank for arrays. This, that basically also means a fixed sized array. Um, this little thing here, if you're not familiar with other languages, 
that have types is called a generic. So this is basically saying this is implemented for an array of any type. So it doesn't matter what type it is, as long as it's an array of that type. That's what this means over here, it's an array of that type. It's implemented, and then the actual implementation just says check the length if the length is bigger than zero. Actually, that should be equal zero. Let me fix that. <laughs> so if the length is zero, it's blank. Um, and then we do a similar, so Rust also has no null. So uh, null is always represented as a type called option. So here we're going to say implement um, is blank for an option of anything. And the option of anything is basically saying, okay, if it's none, which is like the nil question mark method in Ruby. So, uh, and then finally, uh, implement the same thing for bool, right? So basically, in, a, in the same way that you can go ahead and, uh, and implement things in Ruby for any, any type, even types you don't own, you can basically make a trait in Rust and you can implement it for any type. And the way that that gets used is you would say something like imp, use active support colon colon is blank, and then you would be able to use it. So that is the scoping mechanism. You have to say where you want to use it, but once you said that you want to use a trait, it's now imported into that scope and you can use it for any method, uh, any object. So any object that's implemented for us. So we can implement it for, use it for string, for uh, you know, arrays, for booleans. And then the last one of there is I made an array of one and I pulled out the last value of it. And in Rust that would return an option because it could be nil. And like I said before, I implemented this for options. So basically, it works for all these different types. And one really cool thing about Rust traits, actually, is that if you make your own type, so if I make my own type in my own library and I want to implement is blank, I can actually implement it just fine, which means that just like in Ruby, you, know, the blank, you just have to implement the blank question mark method and it will work. If I make my own type and I want it to be compatible with this trait, I can implement it myself. It doesn't have to be something that some, the person who implemented the trait decided to implement in the first place. And so I just showed you a pretty cool feature, which is basically it looks like OO, you know, dynamic dispatch, awesome, everything is a message, et cetera. But like I said before, in Rust, everything is a zero-cost abstraction. So how does that actually work? And the way it works in Rust is that Rust actually knows when it looks at those, when it looks at empty string dot blank, that is blank, it actually knows ahead of time exactly what method that's going to be calling. And it actually will statically dispatch that method to the that method to the specific function that needs to be called, or it might even inline it, and you can explicitly tell it to inline it if you know it's performance critical. Um, also, using traits doesn't involve allocating anything. So even though in a you know, normal language you would basically be forced to allocate because it's virtual dispatch and you need the dispatching table, um, in Rust, simply using a trait doesn't cause any kind of special allocations. Um, it basically works just, it works fast. It's like as if you had written a static method and called it directly, even though now it's basically polymorphic. Now, there's one other thing that you can do with traits that's pretty awesome. So, so far I showed you that you have, a, you know, you have an object and you want to call a method on it, and you can, it can be polymorphic, right? And now I'm going to show you what if I want to make a method, and that method will take something that, is, that implements a particular trait. So in this case, I have a method called, a function called first line, and that first line function is just going to call read line on whatever reader I give it. Now, obviously, I could write a first line function and I could make it specific for standard in or I can make it specific for a file. But what I want to do is I want to make a function that's specific to any kind of buffered reader. And in Ruby, of course, you just do this by saying, please implement the read line method, and I'll call it. In Rust, you say, I'm going to take, you say this thing here, which means I'm going to take, it's generic over any type R, as long as that type implements buffer. And buffer is the thing that implements the read line method. And then here I'm basically saying, I'm taking a mutable reader of that type. And then, sorry, and then when I go to call it, basically, uh, actually, that's another mistake. <laughs> okay, so then when I go to call it, basically, Rust will know, okay, well, you're calling first line, and you can basically call it with a buffered reader, or you can call it with standard in, or whatever type that you want. And again, if you just look at this, you can imagine, well, I'm calling it with some random thing, and it doesn't know ahead of time, uh, it, like the function is not written for a specific type. So probably what that means is that it will be super slow, because it will have to be packaged up, it will have to come with maybe a, 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 a lookup table, and then it will have to get sent, and then it will have to be virtually dispatched. But actually what happens in practice in Rust is that it's super fast, and the reason it's super fast is that every single time you call that function, 
it will basically say, okay, you're calling that function with a buffered reader. I'm gonna go make a special version of that first line function for buffered reader, and I'm gonna use that at compile time. And what that means is that the actual, all the lookups that at runtime are static, are known ahead of time. And again, when I call standard IO standard in, and I call the same function, first line, it's basically as if I had called this special first line two function that was, that was set up. So the idea is that you get the high level um, the high level functionality that you expect, the productivity that you expect from being able to just say, I don't really care what this is, it's just anything that takes a reader, I'll just call read line on it. And under the hood, what's happening is it gets specialized, it gets made super fast. So uh, another way that this is zero cost is that the compiler specializes any methods that use train, what, we, what we call trait constraints. So that's pretty awesome. And I think it's a good example of something where you can get a pretty high level of productivity in even above what most dynamic language, most static languages let you get at a performance level that's much higher than what most static languages let you get. So that's traits. The next thing I want to talk about is iterators and lambda. So if you've written Ruby code or JavaScript code, then what you know is that it's very powerful to be able to use blocks or lambdas to abstract over some kinds of things. And Rust has a thing called, uh, has lambdas, but it also has a feature called iterators, which are, you can basically think of as being the equivalent of lazy enumerators in Ruby. And basically the idea here is that you can basically say, okay, give me a range from zero to 100, and then I'm gonna filter over it by saying it's filtered by, you know, is it divisible by six, and then I'm gonna map it by multiplying by three, and then I'm gonna print it by saying numero whatever, and then run it. And there's, so number one, if you look at this, it looks very, uh, high levelly looks. First of all, there's no types, which is pretty cool. Um, but second of all, it looks high level. It looks, you know, you're using filter and map and all this stuff. But again, you sort of get this zero cost abstraction thing going on. You get so first of all, um, iterators are always lazy, which means there's never any intermediate objects that get created. But unlike in Ruby, that doesn't uh, produce any additional allocations. This is basically all done um, locally. It also uses generics under the hood, like I showed you before, which basically means that every single time you call .map or .filter, it's actually generating a special version of the code for the thing that you're actually trying to do. Um, also, so one thing that you have to do whenever you're doing a loop in a high-level language, if you want to look up, you have an array of 100 items, and you say, give me the 50th item, is that the, at, at best, the compiler has to say, let me check to see if the 50th item is there, and don't let you access memory that's out of the bounds of the array. But if you use something like map, not only is it a higher level of abstraction, you're using a lambda, but you can actually do a single bounce check and say, okay, I can see there's 50 items, so then you can basically just do the rest of the iteration without doing any additional bounce checks as you go through it. So you can get both higher level of abstraction and faster performance at the same time, which is pretty awesome. And finally, Rust actually doesn't have any C style for loops. It only has looping over, uh, it has a, a raw loop, but, it also, but other than that, it only has looping over iterators, and that's because Rust itself is very, very confident in the performance of iterators and the ability to make those very fast and, and efficient and low memory usage. So, I taught, so those are sort of two high-level features, and I think you can definitely see that if you look at these features, that they're features that you would expect to have in a, in a productive language, but not necessarily in a low-level language. So I talked about the fact that this is, if this is uh, productive, but earlier I said that Rust is sort of unique in the, in the sense that it gives you something that's both fast but also safe, unlike a lot C or C++, which gives you uh, fast but not safe. And so far, all the things that I showed you, um, you sort of come to expect from languages that are managed, that are, have a garbage collector, um, don't necessarily come to expect from a low-level language. And there's a reason for that, which is that it's a little bit tricky to do. And I want to show you, uh, I don't want to get too much into the details here, but I want to show you one kind of example that I think will, may help you understand, number one, what's tricky, and number two, how Rust deals with it. So I made a little program here, which is a Ruby program. It has a point, it inherits from a struct with xy, make a line, the line has a length method on it, and the length is just figuring out the length of uh, distance between two points. I made a distance method, which takes two points, makes a new line, p1 and p2, gets the length, and then my count method, basic, I have a count function, which is sort of like the main function here which basically will go get the distance and it will return the right value. Now let me sort of uh, trace through the program what exactly is happening here. So the first thing that happens is I make a new point. And because this is a garbage collected language, because it's trying to be safe, 
and Ruby doesn't really know what else is going to happen with this point afterwards, it's, it's basically forced to allocate that point on the heap. It's basically forced to make an actual object and allocate it and put it somewhere else because it doesn't know what else might happen with this point in the future. So I go and I make a second point. Now the next thing I do is I call the distance function. And the distance function also makes a line object. And again, because Ruby doesn't really know what's going to happen with the line object, it has to go and put a line somewhere on the heap. And then it goes and calls the length method on the line. And the length method actually starts pulling things off of the point, which is actually super dangerous if you weren't garbage collected, right? Because now we're just pulling random things off of this object. So we're really happy that these things are allocated on the heap. Because if they weren't allocated on the heap, if they were basically if they were managed ma manually, if you were basically allocating them and freeing them and you start pulling random things off, who knows what could happen? So we basically go and we pull a few things off. We do some calculations. Then we call the square root function, which is yet another function. We give it the values that we gave it, and then we return. Sorry, and then we return. And what's kind of interesting about this is that I sort of told you a story of it being somewhat unclear about what's going on. Like, what is this point object? What is this line object? I don't really know what's happening here. But what's kind of interesting is that most programs actually are written in this way, in which even though in theory the point object isn't sort of known what it's doing, in practice it's being created, it's getting passed to a bunch of functions, then it's getting returned, and then we're done with it. Right? So in practice what's happening is that we're creating objects, they basically get used in computation, they get returned right away, nobody hangs on to them, people aren't making threads and storing them off or putting them in other structures. right? And what ends, this ends up meaning is that even though in theory this is all very simple and you can sort of understand statically, okay, I can just put the memory in some known location, pass it around, get it back, everything's great. Because of the fact that Ruby doesn't really know, it ends up being forced to go and do a lot of extra uh, memory work to deal with the fact that it doesn't really know what's going on. So let's look at the equivalent program. Let me zoom through that, sorry. So let's look at the equivalent program in Rust. And the first thing that you should note is that it's not that many more lines, right? It's sort of equivalently sized. There's more types obviously involved, so it's a little denser. Um, but there's a little bit of a different thing going on here. So first of all, when we say point over here, um, in Rust, when you say it this way, and when you don't explicitly allocate it, what you're saying is, I would like the point to actually be allocated in a known fixed location that doesn't have to be allocated. Um, and you have to do extra work to make it be allocated somewhere else. So you make these two points, and then you call this other function. And the other function also gets these two points. And the way that it receives them is basically by moving them into this, into this function. So this function is now the owner of these points. And what it does with those points is it makes a line. And it basically takes the points, puts them into a line, and it's basically now created this new object. And again, because, it, because I didn't explicitly say that I want to allocate this somewhere else, now it gets allocated in a fixed known location. And when I call the length function, the length function is getting called. And actually, you might notice something interesting here, which is this ampersand before self. And what the ampersand means is just what it, it means something very simple, which is you can, t you can use this self, but you can't hang on to it. You're not allowed to go make a thread and move it somewhere else. You're not allowed to do something that would cause this reference of this line to outlive this function call. So this is something that you don't get to say in Ruby. You don't get to say this line cannot outlive this function call. But if you do get to say it, now you know for sure what exactly is happening with it. So then you do all the same, sorry, then you do all the same amount of work, but when you return from the length function, you're actually confident that that line hasn't disappeared, which means that the compiler can look at this whole program and it can say, okay, I know, well, it doesn't have to just say I know that I don't, I don't have to allocate anything. We as a programmer have told Rust exactly where it should allocate everything. And so that's, that's fine. That I think you can sort of understand how that could work. Um, but what, but you're probably thinking, okay, well, you can do that, but what if you actually make mistakes? Like, what if you need to hold something for the long, longer than the size of the stack? And let me look at a really simple function here, which is the, uh, a function which opens a new file from a particular path and prints it. And I'll just sort of walk through how this works. So this is a more complicated example. And so what happens is we make a new file, and what we do in the same function is we read from the file, and Again, remember what I said before, which is that in Rust, if you don't say something specific, and this thing that you say specific is box, which basically means put this, box this up and put it somewhere else. If you don't say that, it's always allocating things on the stack. So basically what we said is, open this new file, allocate it here. And then we go print, you know, print line, that says go read some, some stuff from a file, and don't worry about errors, that's what unwrap means. 
And then when we get to the end of this function, it's basically going to go close the file automatically because it knows that only one thing has access to it at a time. So that works fine and as expected and you can't, obviously you can see that there's nothing dangerous that could happen there. We can't accidentally refer to memory that we didn't expect because it's all self-contained. Now let's look at a second example where we actually read the file to a string inside of a thread. So we go and we say, I have a file, let me open the file, and then we go and we spawn a new thread and we read from it. So actually this is also fine because what happened here is that we read from the file in the first place and then we, the only other time we ever used it again in the entire program was inside the thread. So the Rust compiler is like, okay, the file was allocated to one place, now we can get moved somewhere else and we're good. And then when the thread ends up finishing, that's the point at which the file gets deallocated and closed. But there is actually one case that doesn't work, where it's very dangerous and where you'll be doing something bad. And that's here, where you say, make me a file, and then you say, okay, in a thread I want to read from it, and I also want to read it from it outside of here, the thread. Obviously, in a garbage collected language, this is totally fine, because what will happen is the garbage collector will hold a reference, will hold two references, and it will wait till both of them get cleaned up, and then it will clean it up. But what, like we said before, what we would like to be able to do is not have to worry about the garbage collector. And what hopefully you've seen so far is that in many, many cases, you can just write normal programs and everything will work fine and you won't have to worry too much about these rules, right? But you may write a program where you decide to have a file and, or any, any object and have it be referenced from two threads at a time or if there's other ways to have this happen. And if you go ahead and do that, if you try to do something that violates the ownership rules in Rust, you get a compile time error. And what that compile time error will say is, hey, you use this moved value file and there's more that it prints out which tells you exactly where it was used in other places, right? So basically what this means is that if you actually end up doing something where you try to do something that would require a garbage collector, then obviously since Rust doesn't have one by default, you, it will basically, it will give you an error. And what this means is that you can write most of the time normal programs that, you, that are very memory efficient, that are very fast, that are, uh, that don't, that are also very safe, but you do have to worry about the case where you're doing something dangerous, but unlike in C or C++, you get notified when you try to do something dangerous. Um, so um, this probably was a little involved for people, and that's fine. I think ownership is probably, the only reason I talk about it here is because ownership is the number one topic that I think people need to know when they learn Rust, because there, it's kind of magic how you, base, how you get automatic memory management, but also no GC, and also it's safe. It's like kind of a magic combination, and this is how it works, that there's sort of a set of rules that you have to follow about who gets to own what pointers, but it ends up being very powerful. So that's called ownership, and if you start learning Rust, make sure you pay special attention when you come across a section of the guide or whatever tutorial that talks about ownership. So let me go sort of back to the beginning, which is, why does this end up mattering for anybody? The reason it ends up mattering is because Rust sort of opens up the ability for people to do low-level systems programming who would not have done it before, like me. I would not have done low-level systems programming before. Um, whenever I wrote C code before I wrote Rust, I was always very afraid and I always didn't really feel comfortable experimenting because I knew that if I wrote 500 lines of C code and tried to put it in production, there was a good chance that I made some kind of mistake. Even the people who write browsers uh, who are the best C++ hackers in the world make mistakes and get exploited. So I was never very comfortable experimenting in my own applications with C code or C++ code because they were so dangerous. And what this lets you do, what Rust lets you do is it lets you say, I have some area that has been driving me crazy performance-wise. I've tried everything. It's been crazy. I've spent all this time, you know, reading the C code, learning how the JIT works, all this stuff. And I just want to basically go in and be explicit about the performance requirements. This is something that you can really experiment with and not worry that you're going to write a little bit of low-level code and all of a sudden you're going to start having your app crashing constantly. And what this also means, if you're willing to go and learn Rust, is that you can, if there's an area where performance actually matters, you can beat your competitors, right? If you're a high-frequency trading company and all your competitors are writing code in Java and they have all these GC pauses and you write your code in Rust, maybe you'll be able to you know, beat them out. And so obviously don't do this whenever performance doesn't matter, but when performance matters, probably your competitors have similar performance requirements, and you, could, you, could compete, you can outcompete them. And just in general, it's safe. I think it's easy to think about low-level code and say, low-level code is either, you know, low-level code is super dangerous and it's so hard to write and there's all these crazy C macros and what's happening here, and 
Rust is a safe language. It's a productive language. It's not as high level and as productive maybe as Ruby, but if you care about performance, I think it's great. It's safe. Um, Rust enables a whole new generation of high level programmers to write systems level code. So I think what you should ask yourself is what can you do with that power? Thank you very much. <laughs>